just to put everybody at ease, you know, more people die because of car crashes in Yosemite Valley than they do because of rock falls, you know, so there's way less danger than... Does that put you more at ease? (laughs) (laughs) After uh, describing our Mario Kart experience in in Yosemite Valley, I I do believe that as well. This is the Exploring the National Parks podcast with Dirt in My Shoes. My name is Ash, and I'm a former park ranger and the founder of Dirt in My Shoes. I think that the parks are best seen from the trail, and I'm here to make national park trip planning easy. And I'm John. I carry the kids on the trails, I tell stories, and notice all the things that Ash doesn't care about much, like rocks. Join us as we show you around America's spectacular national parks. We're sharing our favorite places, fun facts, adventures, and misadventures. And we'll even throw in a little trip planning. Let's start exploring. All right, I am really excited for today's fun facts episode because we get to talk all about one of my favorite national parks, Yosemite National Park. And I can't wait to kind of get into what makes this place such a cool national park. But just exploring it is such a fun adventure. I'm excited. I love Yosemite so much. And it has a cool history. (laughs) It does. It has such a cool history. It has a really neat geologic history, but also has a really cool human history. And there's a lot of things that kind of, when you learn about why this place was made a national park, there's multiple different reasons. You know, a lot of national parks were made national parks like the Grand Canyon because of their geology. And some national parks are made national parks because of the animals that are there, like Denali, where it was the doll sheep that was a big reason for it. Or, you know, Joshua Tree, you know, to protect the Joshua Trees. Well, Yosemite was really two out of those three. It was made a national park because of some really big, beautiful trees and because of the granite landscape. The geology is just, I don't know, there's there's just so much cool stuff. We're going to get into it today. Boom. Yosemite five facts. I'm so excited. All right, let's go. Okay. First fun fact about Yosemite is granite. Granite, 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 just granite everywhere, you know? And so do you know where granite is formed, Ash? I do not. Okay. Well, granite is an igneous rock. And igneous rock means that it was formed because of heat. And so there's one more word that I'm going to throw out there. It's called plutonic. Plutonic, it's igneous rock that was heated and melted underneath the Earth's surface And then it stayed there, and over a long period of time, it cooled down, okay? And so lava, like metamorphic rock, that you know, lava that comes out, it cools, it's really superheated, it gets blown out of a volcano, and it cools really, really fast. And a lot of lava rock kind of breaks down pretty quickly. But this rock, plutonic granite, which is what Yosemite is all made of, is superheated rock that was superheated and because it was superheated granite kind of floats to the surface in some ways it displaces other heavier rocks and rises to the top and then what happens is it was allowed to cool really slowly and so that means that it's super durable and so that's kind of the very most basic thing you need to know about the geologic history of yosemite is that the granite in Yosemite is so durable and so strong. And beautiful. And beautiful. I love granite. Yeah, it's so great. That's one of the reasons why it's such a good rock climbing rock, too, is because it's so durable. It's not just going to like snap off, you know, while you're hanging on it. But yeah, so what happens is there was this giant magma chamber of this igneous rock, this granite underneath the ground. And for thousands, millennia, millions of years, who knows exactly how long. They think that it could have been formed over like, I don't know, a hundred and something million years back during like the Cretaceous period. So dinosaur time is this giant chamber of magma got superheated. It got spread out all along the Sierra Nevada, wherever that's at. So the eastern edge of California. And then over the next hundred million years or so, it cooled down nice and slow. But then there was another thing that happened at the same time. The whole eastern side of California, the whole Sierra Nevada area, got slowly lifted and tilted. And so the eastern side 
of the Sierra Nevadas is super steep, but the west side of the Sierra Nevadas generally slopes down kind of nice and easy down into the Central Valley of California. Interesting. Yeah. If So what you see, as that land got higher and higher and higher and higher, the snow started to accumulate and accumulate year after year after year. And as it got higher and higher and higher over millions of years, and as the climate on the planet cooled, huge ice fields and glaciers began to appear and started to carve out valleys and these big glacier. It was almost like a big plateau, a glacial plateau started to get worn away. But if you know how it tilts to the the west, then you'll notice as you look at all the rivers and stuff like that, it kind of the canyons kind of slowly glide down the the west side of the Sierra Nevadas. And so that's why the Yosemite Valley kind of goes along that same route, does the same thing. This huge glacier formed on top of this massive glacial plateau in a way, and then it just carved it all out. And what we have today, as the climate has warmed and as the kind of the glaciers have disappeared, what we have today are these beautiful glacial valleys that are the remnants of what was a giant ice field with lots of glaciers. So it's pretty much the whole Sierra Nevada range uh, granite? Yeah, but different kinds of granite. So just because it's granite doesn't mean that it's uniform. And so there's lots of different kinds of granite. But yeah, most of the Sierra Nevadas, that's why they're so durable and that's why they're so beautiful and great they're and like strong. They're like sparkly. Yeah, they're sparkly and strong and awesome. But yeah, the granite is everywhere in the Sierra Nevadas. And so you've got the highest point in Yosemite is somewhere around 13,000 something feet. And then down south, a little bit further south, still in the Sierra Nevadas, the highest point in the lower 48 is Mount Whitney in Sequoia National Park. And so that is still part of this mountain range, still part of this giant remnant of this magma chamber of granite that over time eroded away from the glaciers. And, you know, we still have some left. There's, I think there's two glaciers still remaining that are small in Yosemite. But that is the main force that has kind of shaped the way that the Sierra Nevadas are right now, is the uplift, the tilt, and then the addition of glaciers that carved everything out. I really love, like, that's probably one of my favorite things about Yosemite is Mm -hmm. that everything is granite. And Uh so even while you're hiking, I mean, it's like that beautiful, at least from what I can remember, you know, it's like that beautiful, like white with the black speckles, Uh you know, kind of like quintessential, like granite countertop. (laughs) It's amazing as you're hiking because you're just hiking amongst just like these massive granite peaks Mm -hmm. and it's like holy smokes like one of the things that's so cool as you look at the peaks and as you look at the different domes one of the testaments to how sturdy and durable the granite actually is is the fact that those domes are still there right because when the glaciers came through Mm -hmm. it didn't clear everything out right because it's still so strong and the domes are kind of imagine like The magma plumes, you know, they form in lots of different shapes and things like that, but they kind of push up against the other rocks that they're around. And a lot of the domes are the spots where they were pushing up against other kinds of rock. So I'm thinking Lambert Dome, like in in specifically, Uh when you look at Lambert Dome, you know, you can see that the one side of it is pretty gradual. Uh Uh-huh you know, going up, that would have been the side where the glaciers met first. Right. Right. And then they just like scraped up and up and up, you know. (laughs) And then as they kind of went around it, there wasn't as much tension as it went up and around, Mm -hmm. making that other side pretty steep. Right. Yeah. You know, so I'm now I'm thinking, you know, with like half dome, because like when you see half dome in pictures, I mean, it literally does just look like someone just took a knife and just cut off half of it. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, like that side, that sheer cliff is just so crazy. Yeah. Um. So when you see it in pictures, it's just like, wow, like it's amazing that you can even see that. But then you see it in person and it's just like even more so like, holy smokes, like how is this <laughs> thing still like, how does it even look the way it looks? Yeah. So I'm assuming it towers over the valley mm-hmm. and the side that is sheer is the side that 
is toward the valley. Right. And so, you know, those glaciers coming through, I mean, they must have just like been scraped. so powerful. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it would have had to be a massive glacier carving out that valley, but enough so that it could just literally like scrape off one side mm-hmm. of the granite and leave the whole other side like intact. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting. I was actually reading a story a while ago and some geologists wonder if there ever was another half. Like maybe there wasn't an actually another half or maybe it was carved away by glaciers. I think there's still some mystery there that we maybe we don't exactly know the history of it. I feel like there would have to be another half. How else would it look like dome? <laughs> Like that would be crazy. The... How else would it form to be that sheer on that side if it didn't? I don't know. know. There's there's some mysteries still in how a lot of this stuff formed. But I think one of the coolest. So Half Dome sh- definitely does kind of show the raw power. But I think because there's a little mystery there, my favorite illustration of the raw power of those glaciers is actually up the valley just a little bit more from Half Dome oh. to Clouds Rest. Yeah. Because you can see Clouds Rest really well from Olmstead Point, but you can see exactly like the telltale signs of glaciers just clawing away at the granite. And some of the pictures like of people that hike the Clouds Rest Trail and things like that, I don't know exactly if this happened because of the glacier pressure on the granite or if it was, you know, part of the heating and cooling process that happened millions and millions of years ago. But some of that granite is polished just like, you know, your countertop at home. Oh, really? Yes. On Clouds Rest. Yeah. And in lots of other places throughout Yosemite, too, is you have this polished granite just like a countertop, you know. And so you can, it almost gives you like a magnifying glass. You can see a lot of the crystals inside the granite. You know, you can see the different colors. You can see the grain size and different things like that. And then you'll also have it like right next to an unpolished section where it's really raw and gritty. Interesting. You know? And so I don't know if that's a result of the glaciers sitting on top and causing so much pressure and clawing away at the rock to break it down, or if it was part of the heating and cooling process. But either way, it's so cool. Clouds Rest is probably my number one bucket list hike uh, in, in Yosemite. Yosemite right now. Yeah. yeah. It's so cool. That one has been on my list for so long. And a lot of people don't even know what Clouds Rest is. It's not like a super obvious formation when you're Mm -hmm. looking at things. It's just like, kind of like you said, it's just kind of like a giant mound. Uh But I mean, the views from up there are supposed to be phenomenal. Because you're looking down the valley and you can actually, instead of like hiking to the top of Half Dome Uh and looking around, you know, which I've heard also is awesome. But hiking to the top of Clouds Rest puts you right next to Half Dome. And so you get Half Dome in your view. Right. And so I, I'm i dying to hike up there. Cool. I just need to ditch the kids because they're our limiting factor right now oh, for hikes really like that. Are. They're good hikers too. But man, yeah, it's, it's a little bit crazy. So that's fun fact number one is granite. And granite is everywhere. Granite is all over the park. It's the main defining feature of like the rocks and everything in Yosemite Valley because there's some other rocks at the park too. There's other kinds of rock too. But if I had to give one major geologic feature of Yosemite, it's granite. Very cool. And it is everywhere. You'll see it in domes. You'll see it in valleys. You'll see granite rock faces like El Capitan, you know, with just sheer cliffs or like for Glacier Point, you know, huge cliff faces but these are like super strong, super durable. They fought against glaciers for millennia, you know, and this is what you have left. What we are able to see and explore now, what you'll hike on and climb on and see in all the pictures, that is the holdouts. That's the, the strong man that remained after the battle between glacier and granite happened. Very, very cool. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I love granite. Yeah. So fun fact number two. It has to do with that a little bit, but it's more like shape. The landscape was shaped by more than just the glaciers, though. So because the glaciers receded long, long time ago, they've been gone for a long time. I don't know. It's kind of like that Lord of the Rings quote with worm tongue, you know, and Saruman, you know, he's filling up that one thing with black powder and worm tongues like, how can fire undo stone? You know, really water. How can water undo stone? And there are lots of different ways 
in Yosemite that water, even though the glaciers are gone, the water still continues to shape and form a lot of what we see. And so from the hydrology of the area to, you know, freezing and unfreezing and freezing and unfreezing mechanisms to rocks that age and then just fall, there's lots of ways that Yosemite in general is still being shaped today. And so did you know that California gets half of its water from the Sierra Nevadas? That doesn't surprise me, Mm -hmm. only because I know like most of the water in Yosemite, I mean, well, all of the water in Yosemite goes to some very big population centers in California. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we were talking a minute ago about that uplift that happened and then kind of the western tilt of the land right there. So what that does is it gives all of the moisture that comes in off of the ocean, all the storms that flow from west to east, what happens is they slowly, slowly get lifted up. All that moisture gets lifted and raised up higher and the clouds get more and more and more saturated with moisture. It's called an orographic event that happens to the water. And so what happens is it gets lifted and lifted really, really high in the Yosemite area. It gets lifted up to like 13,000 feet and in other places higher. But then as it gets higher and higher, basically the the clouds get wrung out, like, mm-hmm. like when you wring out a rag. And so it drops all of that moisture on those mountains. And then as it continues on, there's nothing left for it to drop. And yeah, so which that's... is why Death Valley is the way it is. Exactly. Because it's crazy. Like when you go to Death Valley, I mean, you're not that far from the Sierras. You're actually really close to the Sierra. <laughs> right. You're all like less than 100 miles away from you're Mount just, Whitney. You're on the wrong side. You're yeah. on the rain shadow side. So I'm assuming, you know, all that moisture drops in the Sierras right there. Mm-hmm. And then it probably flows down towards the West, right? Because that's the side that's more flowy. Yeah, there are some like the the area on the East side, like close to Bishop, used to have a lot of water. That's where a lot. Of, actually, that's where a lot of Los Angeles gets its water is from the water that flowed east off of the Sierra Nevadas and goes towards Bishop. And and I think it's Allen Lake, I think is what it's called. But a lot of that water goes to Los Angeles. But yeah, a lot most of the water flows west and feeds all those. There's so many population centers there. A lot of the water from Yosemite goes to San Francisco too. And so one of the things that's really cool is the Sierra Nevadas are fairly temperate. Like they're not like super duper freezing cold mountains. And because there's such a a high diversity in elevation of those mountains, you'll have lots of different zones of life. And so depending on the temperature of a storm that comes in, you could have really low elevation snow if it's cold or if it's a higher temperature storm, you know, the, the snow could drop really high elevations and just kind of rain down low. But that's one of the things that makes the Tuolumne Meadows really special is because it dropped. There's always constant snow up there, it, like April, May and stuff like that. When things start to warm up, you'll have huge floods of the Merced River and some of these other rivers will really get full. And what happens is they'll wash a lot of the sediment from those remaining glacial moraines down river. And so they'll replenish a lot of the valleys that we have, like the Yosemite Valley. It'll get lots of nourishment from when those spring floods come. But at the same time, the rivers are kind of carving their way through the valley too. The landscape is still being shaped by this yearly replenishment of nutrients from the higher elevations nourishing the lower elevations. So like the Tuolumne River that goes in a higher elevation, that's actually working its way down. Mm-hmm. into the valley right the meet up with the merced river down at that point or you know the merced river i guess comes from the high country too right what i think is interesting um now that you mention it you know you've got almost every year i feel like in like april ish i've seen pictures i've never been to yosemite during this time mm-hmm. but the spring flooding right like they literally they have to close campsites because they get flooded they had a huge one a few years back where it literally like, I think the water, like they had markers um, where the roads were supposed to be and stuff uh, because just like the valley was just massively flooded. (laughs) Right. 
these are huge events that yeah. happen every year. So these rivers, yeah, and it is. It's kind of always in the spring and at least some flooding. You know, obviously some years are worse than others. But yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I've been watching it because I just think it's so cool. But but yeah, there was one a few years back where it's just like, oh, there's like nothing there. It just like covered the valley. Yeah. You know, so that is really cool. Plus, you have to think, you know, the sheer power of those massive waterfalls that are coming down those huge cliffs, Mm -hmm. you know, have to be doing quite a bit of work of curving too. Yeah, absolutely. And so they're doing a lot of work there, the rivers. So uh, the glacial valley versus like a river valley have very different shapes. And so the glacial valleys will be very rounded and the river valleys generally are like a V-shaped. And so because we've got these big glacial valleys, but at the very bottom, some a lot of times when things move a little bit quicker, you'll see like a V-shape happen like that. And so these valleys, they're still in flux. They're still being shaped currently. And so, but yeah, they're doing a lot of work right now. But one of, my, one of the scariest things to me is if you look at the valleys right now, because the glaciers have been gone for so long, one of the big forces that shapes the, the valleys now is just rock fall. And so... There's lots of different ways that it can happen. Like if there's a crack in the rock and then there's a big rainfall, you know, and then if it gets below freezing, the water will expand a little bit and cause the rocks to separate even more. And if that happens over and over and over and over again, I mean, there a few years back, there was a big rock fall, you know, where you've got semi truck sized rocks falling thousands of feet. And you know how you can tell the difference between a recent rock fall and an old rock fall? No. Lichen. Oh, oh, interesting. Yeah. And so if you see a giant rock in the middle of a valley or close to like Curry Village, or if you see something in lots of different areas of the park, if you see a giant rock on it and it looks pretty clean, it's new. And if you see one that's covered in lots of different mosses and things like that, it fell more than 100 years ago. It's been there for a long time. That one that you're talking about, I like how everything we say is like a few years back because we don't actually know, you know, exactly <laughs> know. when it was, but we know it was like within somewhat recent because we remember seeing it on the news or yeah. something. That massive rock fall, wasn't that a portion of Half Dome? I don't there remember, was one there. Yeah. but I feel like a, a chunk of Half Dome, like the front of Half Dome had a big rock fall not that long ago. The one that I was thinking of was closer to like the the Great Arch area was so okay. on the, on the maybe, other side of the valley. Maybe that's the one I was thinking of too. I just, I remember there was a big one and I was like, there are so many people in Yosemite Valley, like for a rock fall that occur there, which like you said, they do, mm-hmm. you know, it is kind of, I mean, it's not like they're not happening right where people are. Right. Well, there was one that happened in Curry Village not too long ago, but (laughs) a few years back. (laughs) (laughs) I don't remember exactly when this was, but one took out a couple of buildings in the Curry Village area. But just to put everybody at ease, you know, more people die because of car crashes in Yosemite Valley than they do because of rock falls, you know, so there's way less danger than. Does that put you more at ease? (laughs) (laughs) After uh, describing our Mario Kart experience in in yosemite valley i do i do believe that as well oh my gosh but yeah that's really cool i think sometimes you know when you look around it's hard to remember that things are still changing especially in like those big mountain parks Mm -hmm. because it's like you know yeah you see the glacial valleys and stuff and you're like yeah you know that got carved out a long time ago and versus somewhere like arches national park where you can literally like see the chunks falling, the arches sometimes and stuff. You know, I think, I think for me, like, I don't think about Yosemite as somewhere that's constantly changing. Right. As much as some of the other places. So. Well, I do think because it's granite, it is still way more sturdy than, you know, we're, we're making it out to be like, it's kind of scary talking about rock falls and stuff like that. It just happened a few years ago, you know, but the granite is strong. It's sturdy. It's very durable, but it's a living landscape. You know, so things do change. And yeah. they one of the park rangers that I was watching talk about this. He was like, yeah, we're trying to figure out like computer modeling so that we can predict rock fall. But that's pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if they'll ever be able to predict it because who knows what's happening beyond the surface of the rock? You yeah. know, you never really know. It, it's cool. Like the people, 
So a lot of the natives in Mesa Verde, what they would do is because they like in Mesa Verde, they're living underneath these giant rocks. Well, in order to keep themselves safe, what they would do is they would climb up these cliff faces and they would shove sticks in between any of the cracks that they could. So they would wedge these sticks in between the rocks. And then if the sticks ever fell out, they then knew they knew were shifting. time to move our house. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> we can't do that in Yosemite, probably. <laughs> <laughs> right. Be, well, I don't know. We got lots Maybe. of rock climbers. Yeah. Yeah. Forget the computer model. Just go <laughs> shove some sticks and some crack. Yes, exactly. Very cool. All right. So that's fun fact number two. The landscape is still changing and it's really cool. Hey friend, I am just interrupting this episode real quick to let you know that you can get a fully planned out hour by hour itinerary for this national park on dirtinmyshoes.com. Maybe you're feeling a little overwhelmed by all the ins and outs of the trip planning process, or you might have a fear of missing out on all the best sites and activities in the park. You've probably also heard the horror stories about how busy this park gets and are hoping to actually find some solitude while you're there. Friend, with a Dirt in My Shoes itinerary, all you have to do is show up at the park and follow the schedule. It's exactly what I would do if I was with you. You won't have to fight for a parking space, and you won't have to worry about missing out on anything cool. And on top of all of that, you'll always have the most up-to-date information. I keep your itinerary updated in real time, so you'll know all about what's happening in the park when you go. This is super helpful because what if an activity or a road is closed for construction? I'll provide you alternative options for that. Maybe extra reservations are needed to enter certain areas of the park. That can be so stressful, but I will help you snatch up those hard-to-get reservations. And what if Mother Nature strikes, which she really always does, with a major weather event like wildfires or flooding. I'll make sure you can easily navigate through those changes while still filling your days with fun and adventure. I am here for you every step of the way. You'll find a link to the itinerary in today's show notes, or you can go to dirtinmyshoes.com to find all of the available itineraries. It's time for an epic national park vacation, and I can't wait to see you out on the trail. Okay, fun fact number three, and this is my favorite. Fun fact, because it's my favorite feature of the park, which is odd because I talked a lot about granite, but there are giant, massive, huge, incredible trees in Yosemite National Park. And the giant sequoias that are here are so cool. I want to want my whole life. I just loved big trees. And I thought that I had seen big trees until I finally made it to Yosemite. And I had not. I was totally defrauding myself because there are so many big trees in Yosemite and the sequoias that are here will blow you away. Yeah. Sequoias are my, I love sequoias (laughs) so much. They are so great. I think they're my favorite tree. I think, you know, redwoods are cool because they're so tall, but I feel like just like the girth of a sequoia, you know, it's Mm -hmm. just like, I mean, he is just a big, sturdy, you know, amazing, massive, strong tree. How many girth units do you think these trees have? (laughs) I don't know what a girth unit is. What's his name? Brian Regan. Oh, Brian Regan. <laughs> yes, that's a. I've, I would love for Brian Regan to do a bit on the girth units of sequoia <laughs> trees because they're so big. They're huge. Not only are they huge, they're the largest by volume living organism on the planet. And as far as we know, the universe, because we don't know what's out there. But so the, the giant sequoia trees are the largest living things on the planet. And they are just so big. And what's so cool is I love redwood trees, and I think redwood trees, they're so much taller than sequoia trees, but they don't have as much volume. because They're not they're, as beefy. Yeah, they're not quite That's as beefy. That's what I love about the sequoias. They're like, they're so beefy. Yeah. And one of my favorite features about the sequoia trees that really helps them stand out to me is their color. Yeah. Because a lot of trees, you know, they have a very similar color, you know, brown bark kind of a look, but the sequoia trees stand out from every other tree because they're they're a little bit more orange. And their bark is different. They're more spongy of a bark. And so they're just, I don't know, you can look through a forest, see, okay, a sugar pine, ponderosa pine, ooh, cedar tree. Oh, cool. Whoa, 
sequoia tree. Boom. You can easily tell which ones are the sequoia trees. And they're so much bigger. They're so much taller. It's like looking at Yao Ming in China. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, versus all all the other Chinese people. Exactly. Yeah. He, it's like watching him walk down the street. And he could be walking around anywhere. You know, it's Yao Ming versus anybody. So Yosemite has so many sequoia trees. The Mariposa Grove, I mean, has a lot of the most important trees, I think, in sequoia history, because at least in terms of like the National Park Service. But the most famous tree is in the Mariposa Grove, and it's called the Grizzly Giant. And we saw that the first time we were there, and we were like, oh my gosh, it's so big. One of the things that in the life cycle of a sequoia tree, what they do is they'll drop a lot of their lower branches. And so sometimes the first branch on a tree, you won't have until like 150 feet up. And so that's the first branch. Well, the lower branches on the Grizzly Giant are like seven to eight feet in diameter. Yeah. Which is bigger than most trees ever get. And so, I mean, that's just crazy to me. I'm six foot three. My whole body, like I stretch out my arms up as high as I possibly can. You know, I can get like eight feet tall with my arms straight up in the air. That's as big as the diameter of a branch of this tree. (laughs) Yeah. Like that just blows me away. That's crazy. And so, That is so, so neat. And to give you some of the other dimensions of the tree, the grizzly giant, it's 209 feet tall. The circumference of the tree, so the circumference is measuring the perimeter, how wide all the way around is 96 feet. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. So how many people do you think it would take to like hold hands and hug (laughs) that tree, right? Oh my gosh, it'd be like 25 people to hug that tree all the way around. and. At one point, before they had like checked out all the groves of sequoias and everything like that, they thought that it was the biggest tree in the world. Well, right now, it's the 26th largest tree in the world or largest wow. sequoia tree in the world. Yeah, that's great. Because I was going to ask you, you know, um, having been, I mean, because Sequoia National Park is only a few hours from Yosemite. Mm-hmm. And we've seen both, you know, we've seen the sequoia trees in Yosemite and we've been to Sequoia in Kings Canyon. And I was was just going to say, you know, I feel like I love sequoia trees and you definitely want to go see the Mariposa Grove while uh-huh. you're in Yosemite. But I was wondering kind of how they how they uh, measure up to the sequoia trees that you actually see in Sequoia Kings because we got to Sequoia Kings and it was like, wow, I have not seen a tree yeah. before. Oh my gosh. You know, it was, I even compared to Yosemite. And so I love the sequoias in Yosemite mm-hmm. so much. But, yes. but yeah, that the biggest tree in Yosemite is 26. Uh huh. Kind of tells you, you know, how there are bigger trees, sequoia trees out there to be found, especially in Sequoia Kings. Yeah. Exactly. That's why it's worth, I get asked that question a lot, you know, should I go to both? And that's why it's worth going to Yosemite and Sequoia Kings. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You should definitely do both. Go to Yosemite first so that you don't discount the ones you see there um, because, oh, this is only number 26, you know. <laughs> it's massive. But yeah. It's so great. Oh, uh, They're so big. They're so cool. It will blow you away. But and- you said that the sequoia trees in Yosemite were a part of why it became a national park. Yeah, it's really important. So the trees themselves brought up a really important question. And we're going to get into that in fun fact number five. Because the trees themselves bring up a really important question that we'll discuss a little bit later. But they're the reason behind Yosemite in the first place. And so when you're thinking about these trees, think about what is their value? Is it in board feet? How many pieces of wood I can get out? How many houses I can build out of this? We're going to get into that in fun fact number five. But, you know, what's so cool is this grove of sequoia trees was first protected by Abraham Lincoln. Mm. He was the one that signed the bill or the law that put in place the original protections for those trees. And it's kind of amazing to me, like during the Civil War, I think it was 1864 or something like that. The North and South are bitter at war. Yeah, they had some other things to think about. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Protecting sequoia trees in California. Exactly. And so it's kind of crazy to me. I'm wondering like, okay. What, were they thinking like, sure, you know, whatever. We've yeah. got more important things <laughs> to like, think. like, oh my gosh, get out of my office. <laughs> or, 
you know, was it an important thing? Like, was it a, was it a big debate? Like, yeah, what is the value of this? We'll get into that a little bit more, but those trees are so important. As you look on the arrowhead for the National Park Service, that tree that is on the emblem of the arrowhead is a sequoia tree. Yeah. And that is why it's there. But the sequoia trees, the reason they get so big and the reason that they're so limited in space, there's only three groves in Yosemite. You would just think that they grow everywhere. Sequoia trees only grow in very certain conditions. They have to have so that moisture that is coming from the Pacific that is slowly getting lifted up into the Sierra Nevadas. And because the Sierra Nevadas are somewhat temperate, you know, they're very wet, but they don't get super duper cold. And the snow kind of slowly melts during the springtime and gives a fair amount of water reserves during the summertime. That's what allows these trees to grow so big. You know, they have to have the perfect conditions to grow. And because they're so tall, like the redwood trees and sequoia trees, a lot of the moisture, they don't actually get from their roots. They have to suck in the moisture through their upper limbs. And so they have to be in a pretty moisture rich area that has consistent moisture always coming through. So being by the coast, having the water slowly getting pushed up and then all having it drop, boom, right in the Sierra Nevadas is the only location, the only way that these trees can grow so big. And what's neat is the biggest trees aren't necessarily the oldest. And so proving the point that the conditions have to be perfect, some of the biggest trees are the ones that are like in the most perfect and most wet spots. Yeah, they found the prime spot. Yeah, exactly. But these trees can be 3,000 years old. That just blows me away. Yeah. (laughs) Like we've talked about bristlecone pine trees that can be up to 5,000 years old, you know, but these giants, these incredible huge, long living trees. They're not only the biggest things on the planet, but they're some of the oldest. And it's kind of hard to fathom, you know, how long these things have actually been here, how many fires they've weathered, how many huge storms they've gone through, how many big wind storms they've, you know, weathered and things like that. They've been through it all. And one of my favorite trees of all the sequoia trees, it's not the biggest trees. It's not the one that people always see on the postcards. I love as you walk through a sequoia grove, whether it's in Sequoia Kings or whether it's in Yosemite, you will see trees that have been burned. You will also see trees that have like been cut and hollowed out so that people can drive their cars through them or so that people can walk through them and to to kind of sense how big they really are. But what's amazing is even after trees can have holes carved in them so people can walk through them or drive their cars through or been completely burned out, these trees survive and heal themselves. Yeah, that's my favorite thing about the sequoias. I think besides the beefiness, it's Mm -hmm. just like I love seeing those ones that have been burned or whatever. And it's like you look at it and you're like, there's no way that could still be alive. Uh And yet it is. It does. It heals itself. It's bark regrows, you know, Mm -hmm. over these parts that have been cut out or burned out. So yeah, it's so impressive. I mean, moral of the story here is don't skip the Mariposa Grove (laughs) when you're in Yosemite. Don't skip it. Oh, yeah. And if it's closed, you know, there are, you can go to the Tuolumne or the Merced Grove. You know, there's a couple other groves in there. But if you can get to the Mariposa Grove, that would be the one that I would go see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's fun fact number three, the big trees. They're so cool. You got to go see them. Fun fact number four is fire. Okay. I just talked about how some of these sequoia trees get burned and native peoples, people have been living in the Yosemite area for 8,000 years. The tribe that was in Yosemite Valley when a lot of the settlers arrived in California and then later on when, you know, the 49ers came through. But the native people that were living in Yosemite Valley, I think one of the most impressive things to me isn't the fact that they were hunting and gathering, you know, they were using spears and the atlatl to hunt and everything like that. The most impressive thing to me is how they saw fire. They saw that it was natural. They saw that it was a necessity and they used it to manipulate their environment. So a lot of people, as they're like 
driving through Yosemite Valley, it's very different from how it was in the 1850s or in the 1840s when a lot of the native peoples were still there. Because what the native people had done is they were using fire, having like prescribed burns basically to kind of keep the valleys nice and clear so that they could have a really easy opportunity for hunting. But not only were they doing that, what I mean when I say that the fire is natural and necessary is that the sequoia trees only can reproduce if fire is happening naturally yeah, and they need, often. They need the heat to clear. Well, they need the fire to clear out some space because mm-hmm. obviously like a massive tree like that needs a good amount of space. Yeah. But also it doesn't, isn't the fire required to open the seeds? Yeah. So what happens is heat rises, right? And so the fires that happen on the ground, what they do is they soften the resin on the, on the pine cones. And so when the resin gets softened, it allows the kind of the boinginess of the springiness of the cones on the inside to open up and drop the seeds. But if the seeds drop and there's plants too much ground cover, too much ground yeah. cover then they can't grow. And so it's a super necessary part of the life cycle of sequoia trees. So the native people, they knew this over thousands and thousands of years. They had this as part of their oral tradition, you know, passing it down from generation to generation that fire is part of life here in the West. But when the European settlers came from the East, fire, they just viewed it as destructive. And so starting in like the 1860s, all the way pretty much to like the 1960s, the government, local people, they all suppressed fire because they saw it as destructive. They saw it as like the worst thing that could happen and they stopped it. Tons of fire suppression all throughout the West. And so if you see pictures from like when the first people were exploring Mariposa Grove and a lot of these other places, these other groves, in between all of these sequoia trees, it was fairly bare. It wasn't like walking through a really lush Eastern forest. I mean, we talked about the sequoia groves, but for like Yosemite Valley, I mean, did it not have trees really either? Was it pretty much clear? So there's a lot of black oak trees that were important, you know, for a lot of the diets of the native people and for some other animals, all the acorns and things like that. But that's one of the things that they're worried about now is the decline in the black oak population because we're not having regular fires to take out some of the older trees. And so that it's making space for the newer ones. Hmm. And so the population even there is dropping and the ecosystem is changing a little bit because fire has been removed from Yosemite Valley. And so that's why now the Park Service and the Forest Service in general throughout the whole West is like changing their tune. They're doing a 180 in a lot of ways. They're doing prescribed burns everywhere to kind of bring the forests back to their natural cycle of life. And that's why we're getting so many of these huge fires out in the West. It's not that we're not supposed to have fires. It's just they're not supposed to be as hot because they're supposed to happen more frequently. They're supposed to clean up the forests and allow for trees like aspens, other pine trees like lodgepole pines, sequoias. So many of these different Western varieties of pine trees and things require regular fires to maintain a healthy population. Well, and fire is a big deal in Yosemite. You know, even this past year, past summer, you know, a good portion of the summer, the valley was socked in Mm -hmm. by smoke, you know. So whether or not, you know, this actually interests you (laughs) as far as, (laughs) you know, how we need to have fires and stuff. I mean, if you're traveling to the park during the main season, then it is going to affect you in some way or another because it's just a reality of it right now. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, is pretty much every summer, (laughs) you can count on just these massive fires in the West. Yeah. Beyond all the damage that happens and and all the sad things that happen, you know, on top of that, it just really makes it so you can't see the park at the very least, if that's what affects you. You know, you just it is it's a huge part of the West in general, especially California, though. California gets some of the biggest, nastiest fires. And there were a few in Yosemite, uh, Sequoia. I mean, all the big fires that have been going through Sequoia National Park, right. Sequoia Kings, you know, and and um, really actually burning up a lot of those Sequoia trees that shouldn't be burning up because mm-hmm. they are 
built to withstand fire, just not the really, really, really hot fires that are happening and right. massive fires, you know. So, yeah, I mean, fire, it's kind of a downer, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like kind of a downer thing to talk about. Yeah. But honestly, I get a lot of questions about that. You know, people who have been planning their trip to Yosemite and they're watching, you know, what's happening and going, is it even worth going if I can't? even see Half Dome, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, it kind of is just something that happens every single summer now. Yep. So at least, you know, they're trying to change the tune a little bit and, and do those prescribed burns and try to get things under control right. a little bit better. But like you said, it's a healthy part of a forest ecosystem. Yeah. And I just think that it's, I don't know, it's so interesting. I think it's the non-downer part is looking at the science and the way that all these plants have kind of evolved and changed to adapt to fire situations because the reason that a lot of these sequoia trees don't have their first branches until like 150 feet is so that they can survive those lower intensity, smaller fires because they don't want their lower branches to catch and raise the fire level to the canopy. Yeah. And so they drop the lower branches and they wait for these smaller fires to soften their cones and let the seeds drop. And it's so cool. But also, one last thing before we move on from these trees, before we move on from the fire. Did you know, fun fact, sequoia cones are so small. Yeah, redwood (laughs) redwood cones too. Yeah. You would think that the biggest tree in the world would have the biggest pine cones. But they don't. They have, they're like, as I don't know, they're like a size of a lime, like a big lime, some of them. You know, they're not very big. And so it's, I don't know, it's just, I don't know. I thought that was so funny to me. Well, what's funny is when you go into Yosemite, you will see a ton of giant pine cones. And you think to yourself, all these trees are sequoias. (laughs) These these sugar pine cones are so big. Yeah, they're They're huge. What, like a foot? Yeah. Eight, or more. You know, eight yeah, inches a foot. Yeah. They're massive pine cones. So like you'll be hiking in Yosemite and you'll be like, that's the biggest pine cone I've ever seen. And it's not a sequoia tree. Like you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even turn your head at a sequoia tree cone. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You like, you'd step on it and be like, oh, yeah. oops. But no, it's crazy. It's, I wonder, I wonder if these other trees are compensating a I little bit. I think they are. <laughs> I think they are. They're like, well, if we can't be the biggest in volume, you know, yep, exactly. we just have the biggest cone. Exactly. Kind of a fun idea. Okay. So yeah, the fire, that's fun fact number four regarding the fire. Fire is important to the whole area of the Sierra Nevadas and the West. But now we're going to move on to fun fact number five, which is the fact that Yosemite brought the biggest question of our time regarding natural ecosystems and everything, the, the natural world. How do we value the natural world? Like, what is the value of it? And that's what was really brought to the forefront of the conversation during like the 1860s and 70s, during the Civil War. You know, Abraham Lincoln, I said, he signed the document protecting the Mariposa Grove because some people had gone into the grove. They had seen these giant trees. They were like, oh my gosh, they were noticing all the people that were coming out to California. You got the gold prospectors. You have tons of the Sierra Nevadas are lush with trees. So timber is a huge business. You know, they're seeing all of these entrepreneurs come out here and they're thinking to themselves, what one of the guys, his name was Galen Clark, if I'm not mistaken. He was a timber guy and he was exploring and he saw these trees in the Mariposa Grove. And that literally changed his life. He was the first person, I think, on record to ever count the number of trees that were in the grove and measure them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that was what he did. But then he spent his whole, the whole remainder of his life basically acting as the guardian of the grove. And so, but we think to ourselves now, like we have this great conservation ethic. A lot of the questions that they were wrestling with then, we're still wrestling with now in a lot of ways when we're considering the natural world. And, but to kind of think about the timeline, 1864, that's when Mariposa Grove was protected. And if you think about the grove itself, those trees actually have tons of value, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you would think as a timber guy going in there and being like, 
I struck the mother load, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to be rich. Yeah. They're looking for gold and they found wood and gold. Yeah. Right? Because one of those trees, thousands of board feet. That one tree is worth so much money to you as a timber man. So, yeah, they, uh, 1864, Abraham Lincoln signed the protection. Yellowstone National Park, 1872. But I think there's a big difference there, though. So even though Yellowstone is my favorite national park, I have the shirt that says oldest and best, you know, but Yellowstone's land, even like in some of the documents regarding Yellowstone, they considered it useless and valueless. Well, and I think that's true because when you go to Yellowstone, I mean, it, especially the parts with the geysers and stuff, it is kind of like, well, what would we do with this anyway? Uh-huh. Right. We might as well I mean, just... It's cool, but like... I mean, there are a lot of trees in Yellowstone and stuff, but, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's not the same. Right. It's very different. And so signing off Yellowstone where they didn't see any value was totally different than the conversation around the Mariposa Grove because they easily, easily could have made tons of money off of it and developed the area. Well, in 1890, they actually made it a national park and the, the names that everybody's heard about John Muir. And he's got a lot of famous quotes, you know, about... Well, so Yosemite was in 1890. Yeah. I don't think I realized it was that early. Mm -hmm. I know, like, Sequoia Kings is pretty early, yeah. too. You know, like, they were they were doing some big work <laughs> Yes, out here in these parks. But I guess I didn't realize it was that early. Mm -hmm. That's cool. There was a lot of conversations, you know, about the natural world. How? What is its value? What is its purpose? in our life. And I'm kind of geeking out a little bit about the philosophy of this, but I think especially in regards to Yosemite, the conversation started here. Yeah. You know, and so that's one of the biggest gifts to our generation of people that Yosemite gave us is the fact that it started the conversation of yes, it's worth this amount in dollars, but in what other ways is it valuable to me? Right, right. The value isn't just in the money. It's in the actual conservation of a beautiful place, things that we don't want to destroy, mm -hmm. you know, or some people started speaking out more against that. Yeah. Well, I mean, know? you've talked about for you how you feel uh, like natural places like Grand Teton and some of these other national parks are very special to you because you just feel different there. You know, John, but you can't, it's hard to put a value on that. Yeah. You know, it, and that's the conversation, right? Exactly. And so, John Muir, he came to this area, you know, and there in the Yosemite Valley, there was a timber mill in the valley. And that's where John Muir actually started working. Mm -hmm. He got his first job in Yosemite Valley in like the timber mill that was located right next to Yosemite Fall. And so, he started out there. And he just explored the area. He lived there for only a few years, but then he spent his life talking about how this place, it's bigger to me. It's like a cathedral, yeah. you know, to him, to a lot of people, these national, these national parks, these natural places are like they're temples made without hands is kind of how he described them. And one of his most famous, famous quotes is anything dollarable is not safe no yeah. matter how much you guard it, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, and the truth of that really is in Yosemite too, because after 1890, after it was made a national park. Oh, I know. They mm -hmm. dammed up Hetch Hetchy. Yeah. So if you don't, if you've never heard of what Hetch Hetchy is, describe it. Tell us what Hetch Hetchy is. Okay. So if you go to Hetch Hetchy, it is beautiful. And in fact, John Muir says that was his favorite. Like he loved that area. Mm -hmm. It rivaled Yosemite Valley right. for him. And it is, it's still just those big granite peaks. There's a massive waterfall in there. You know, it, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. but as it stands right now, it's dammed. Right. There's, there's a big lake in there and they dammed it up so that they could um, use that water for San Francisco. Right. You know, and, and John Muir, I mean, I remember uh, like that more than anything, like he, he made Yosemite his life's work mm -hmm. and that more than anything, like broke his heart right? when they did that because he fought so hard to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. He died not too long after I think the yeah. dam was completed. Yeah. So I think it really did break it, his heart. I think it did. Yeah. And so I think for us, like today, if we're thinking back, you know, we've went from a people going from east to west, you know, manifest destiny, coast to coast. 
we're seeing this beautiful land with all these natural resources and all the opportunity that it gives us to grow as a country and to grow individually and to grow my business and things like that. But then we finally get from coast to coast. And then we notice, at least John Muir noticed slowly, you know, he was a shepherd in Tuolumne Meadows. And then later he realized all of this development were saturating this land and were taking away a lot of the beautiful things that made it so beautiful to us in the first place. And so we have to protect it. And so we had suddenly we have this new conservation or preservation ethic that kind of started out and he start John Muir started the Wilderness Society, you know, and the kind of the idea, at least illustrated in the 1964 Wilderness Act is like where man is a visitor and does not stay hmm. kind of a thing. And so we have this whole ethic that really started in Yosemite. Do we protect these places? How much do we protect them? Do we still utilize them while protecting them, which is more the conservation side of things, you know, where we still use, we still harvest. And that's more the forest service, right? you know, and, and that's why that's, I think, the biggest differentiator yeah. <laughs> between the forest services and the park service is the park service has decided, no, we don't use it right. while we're enjoying it and protecting it. And the forest service is more like, yeah, sure, you know, mm-hmm. we, can, well, we can use it too. Do, do you know what the forest service is inside the Department of Interior? No. It's inside the Department of Agriculture. Oh, interesting. Which really goes to show it's an ethic of we utilize the land while protecting. I just keep thinking about the Ken Burns documentary about the national parks Mm -hmm. because a massive amount of that documentary is about Yosemite. Yeah. And I think it's exactly what you're trying to get across too, which is that this was like the birthplace of talking about those ideas Mm -hmm. and really trying to figure out, you know, our identity as How do we want to handle all this beautiful land that our country has, you know, and and nobody had really talked about it that much, you know, as far as like you said, if it's dollarable, it's fair game. Basically, you got to decide what you're going to do with it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they spent a huge amount of time on that documentary talking about Yosemite as well, because it is such a the beginning point in so many ways. Yeah, it's the birthplace of this conversation. And so that's really why I wanted it to be fun fact number five, because I think without Yosemite, we may have had this conversation based on another national park, but it did start here. Yeah, It's where it began. And because of Yosemite, we have protected trees. We have protected landscapes, protected mountains. We have protected, you know, animals, flora, fauna, you know, everything. There are different places all throughout our country where things are protected because of a different value that yeah. they provide other than dollar signs. And so that's a big deal. It's something that I think is important. It's fun. It's exciting. And it's okay to have different opinions about it too. Because Teddy Roosevelt, when he came and he visited you know, Yosemite, he camped there with John Muir. They had lots of conversations. They camped underneath the grizzly giant. Yeah. They camped on top of Sentinel Dome. You know, they explored things together. They had conversations together. And Teddy Roosevelt, he signed into law. There was a huge amount of benefit to him having those conversations back in Washington, D.C., because he signed into existence five national parks, 18 national monuments, 55 bird sanctuaries and wildlife refuges, and over 150 national forests. Sheesh. <laughs> Teddy, I've always loved Teddy Roosevelt because I know, you know, he did do a lot of that. But it almost goes back like I'm almost like, man, John Muir, man, he was just like he was whispering in Teddy Roosevelt's ear probably for a lot of, you know, those ideals and yeah. stuff. You have to think it probably, like you said, when you're camping with someone, you really have some good conversations. So they probably, I mean, John Muir probably was a huge part of all of that too. Yeah. Oh man, it's so big. But, and Teddy Roosevelt was more on the conservation side. You know, that's why he signed into law more national forests than anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to have a little bit different opinion. You know, there are some places we preserve. There's a lot of places that we conserve. And it's awesome to see because, oh my gosh, I can't imagine the acreage is what makes a huge difference to me. The Forest Service went from having like 32 million acres to like 192 million acres Mm. of ground. I think that's correct. 
if I'm wrong a little bit, you know, let me know in the comments. But well, and Yosemite is surrounded by Forest Service land too. Yeah, you know, we've camped in the Forest Service land outside of Yosemite. So yeah. I mean, it's all it's all right there, just uh, different uses, mm -hmm. you know. But I am grateful that you know, really, that heart of Yosemite is a national park and not a national forest. Mm -hmm. You know, because it does change the way that we take care of it. Yosemite, like. I'm thinking back to like our other Yosemite episode where it was like some wildfire stories and, uh -huh. and you know, like, oh my gosh, this is the best park ever, you know, for this one. But I think it's just a testament to like how much we actually love this park that mm -hmm. we're willing to have kind of the deeper, harder conversations around it. Right. Because it is, it's like, it's one of those places that you go to, you see in pictures and you're like, I've got to go there. You get there. It's phenomenal mm -hmm. <laughs> in every way. Like when I stand in Yosemite Valley and I look at those cliffs and those mountains, my soul is elevated. Right. You know, it just it lifts you. Being there lifts you. And just to think about all of the work and all of the effort that went into starting that conversation and creating that national park. And it was messy. It was super messy and mm -hmm. creating the national park and then having Hetch Hetchy formed, you know, and it just like, it was so messy. But I think that's for me, like where the real appreciation comes in because mm -hmm. the story and the enormous efforts of the people who saw value there mm -hmm. is the spirit of Yosemite for me. Right. Absolutely. I feel like that's a great place to stop because you're exactly right. The spirit of Yosemite is the questions that we ask ourselves when we have those moments alone. You know, what is the value of this place to me? You know, so those are your five facts, your five fun facts about Yosemite. Number one, I mean, there's so much granite, granite, granite everywhere. You know, this whole landscape. Fun fact number two, this landscape is still being shaped today. You know, number three, there are huge, amazing, beautiful trees here. Fun fact number four, fire is a natural part of this ecosystem in this area. And number five, this is the birthplace of the big conservation question. Because Yosemite is on a higher level of beauty in so many ways. It's just, it's, it's so beautiful. It begs higher questions. You know, it asks higher questions of us. What is the value of wilderness? What is the value of nature? To me personally, to us as a society, you know, what is the role of it in our lives? And do we protect it? And obviously, previous generations answered that question with, yes, it needs to be protected. And so I think that's the big question. And we are still answering it today. Thanks for exploring the national parks with us. Please share, like, and subscribe. And if you need any help planning your own trip, click on over to dirtinmyshoes.com. See you next week. Same time, same place. And don't forget to get some dirt in your shoes.